Welcome everybody to the first document analysis video for Unit 9, Society and Culture in the High Middle Ages. In this video, I'm going to cover the Judith Bennett chapter from A Medieval Life, the Ancient History Encyclopedia article about leisure in a medieval castle, and a primary document, the Charter of Loris, issued in 1155. In Unit 9, there were a couple of major objectives. We looked at the life of peasantry and aristocrats, which we're going to delve into in more detail with Judith Bennett and the Ancient History Encyclopedia. We looked at the changing of society due to the revival of trade and the rise of cities and towns, which I'm going to start with the Charter of Lawrence in this video, and in the next video, I'll cover the documentary Filthy Cities, Medieval London. And we also looked at um, the rise of medieval universities and the things going on there, which we'll cover in the next video with David Tullock's article, The Rise of Medieval Universities, and looking at an example of scholastic thinking with a dispute about logical proofs of God's existence from two monks named Anselm and Gaunilo. But for today's video, we're going to focus on the life of the medieval peasantry, we're going to focus on the life of medieval, aristocr of medieval aristocrats, and get into a little bit on what's going on in cities and towns. So one of the major things that the main presentation talked about was the life of the peasantry during the High Middle Ages. And I gave you, once again, you've seen this book before. There was a section of this to read in Unit 8. It's called A Medieval Life, Cecilia Pennyfeather of Brigstock, which is in England, roughly 1295 to 1344. Now, although the time frame didn't necessarily fit, as I commented in the Unit 8 document analysis videos, um, some of the content was still good for that period of time. Now we're moving in to the period of time, the High Middle Ages, that is directly covered by this text. And I gave you a chapter that's talking about what life was like for Cecilia Pennyfatter as she was growing up in the middle of England, and what her world was like and what her responsibilities and her family's responsibilities were as medieval peasants during this period. And the first thing I want to get to is I want to get to what the medieval household was like. This is something I talked about, and I showed you some pictures of a recreated medieval village in England to talk about, like, village life and the church and the village, the peasant household. There's some more description of that here in this. Get out of here. Oh, okay, so Judith Bennett is going to talk about... Like all the houses in Brickstock, it was dark. Some houses had no windows, but the Pennyfatters, as well-off tenants, might have cut a window or two in their walls. If so, the windows had no glass and only shutters to keep out the wind and cold. Like all the houses in Brigstock, the Pennyfatter house was filled with smoke. A fire was essential for warmth and cooking, but as chimneys were unknown among peasants, smoke was vented through a hole in the roof. Perhaps the Pennyfatters, like others who could afford it, built an especially high roof to draw up the smoke to the hole in its apex. Finally, like all the houses in Brigstock, the house in which Cecilia grew up was small. Peasant houses were usually twice as long as their width, and a prosperous family like the Pennyfatters probably lived in a house about 30 feet by 15 feet. Dark, smoky, and cramped, peasant houses were not welcoming places. It was no wonder people usually preferred, weather permitting, to sit outside on benches set against the walls of their houses. So first of all, what we're learning about peasant households is that they're quite small. 30 feet by 15 feet is not a big house. Unless you're a well-off tenant, you're normally going to have a low roof, which will probably have a hole cut in the center of it that is going to be used for allowing smoke to get out through the ceiling, through the roof. If you didn't do that, then the smoke is going to rise. It's going to fill the entire house until it drifts out the windows, if there are any, or through the door if you leave it open. So most of these houses are going to be dark, especially during the middle of the day when the sun's kind of shining right above them and there's no light coming in. They're not going to be very easy to see at either dawn or dusk. They're going to be filled with a lot of smoke because you're going to have a fire ro a roaring in there most of the time. Whenever you have to cook, you need a fire. Whenever it's cold in the fall or English winters or early springs, you're going to need a fire. So they're not real comfortable places to be in, which is why, as Judith Bennett comments, you're going to want to spend a lot of time outside rather than staying in your home. 
Most medieval peasants used rubble only for a low foundation or foot or two off the ground. Then they built the walls by placing posts every few feet and filling in the gaps with wattle and daub, that is, sticks and twigs woven together within the gaps, or with the gaps, excuse me, filled by clay, straw, moss, and other such materials. I like the parenthetical insert here. Sometimes these walls were so flimsy that robbers literally broke into a house by avoiding the locked door and forcing entry through the walls. So, even if a peasant home had some stone, it was normally used just as a foundation that only rose about a foot off the ground, and the rest of the wall was made by taking <clears throat> posts every few feet and inserting them or building the, the stone foundation around them and using that to hold up walls and maybe curving out for the roof. And then for another few feet from the stone up, you would just take smaller sticks and twigs and kind of weave them together. And then fill in the gaps with like clay and mud and straw to kind of block out the in, in block out air and to insulate your house as much as possible. Set at a low point in the walls of the Brickstock house were crux, long curved timbers that rose up to brace the wall and hold the roof. The roof was straw thatch. This was cheap and easy for medieval peasants and prone to disastrous fire. So you've got a fire in the middle of your house that's lifting up smoke and embers into a roof with a hole in it, and that roof is made out of dry straw. That sounds like an absolute recipe for disaster. And at times, I'm sure there were disastrous outcomes for this. So essentially, these houses were made out of whatever natural resources were available in the area. Some stone rubble that might be around... Um, using sticks and tree trunks, using clay and mud and straw to kind of make a structure that could at least provide you with a little bit of shelter and a spot for a fireplace so that you could cook and keep warm. Certainly not lavish living by any stretch of the imagination. And she goes on to talk about the peasant diet, which is also something I mentioned in the PowerPoint. The penny fetters diet was simple. Parents and children ate bread and drank weak ale at every meal. Remember, water wasn't necessarily something that was safe at the time. They didn't understand germ theory, so they don't know that even from like a freshwater spring, you still need to boil the water first to kill any sort of bacteria or anything inside of that water, any sort of spores or anything inside of it. They don't understand that. And the yeast inside of ale, even that's used to make ale, even weak ale, kills the bacteria. And they also ate whenever available, such foods as bacon, sausages, cheese, eggs, fish, onions, leeks, garlic, cabbage, apples, and pears. In some ways, medieval diets, even medieval peasant diets, are more diverse than the diets that some people in the modern world tend to eat. Normally, depending on, as Judith Bennett comments, what was available at the time, what they're growing, depending on what season it is, how successful the harvest was, what they were able to make from little gardens on the sides or orchards, if there was one nearby, what they could gather from common pastures or common woodlands, that type of thing. So peasant diets were pretty diverse and they changed constantly. They were in flux much of the time, depending on what they grew and what was naturally available. Normally their bedding just consisted of like a sack with like straw inside of it. They're not necess they're not sleeping on, you know, nice comfy mattresses like we tend to sleep on now. Here on page, what am I on? I'm on page 19, getting into some of the things that peasants were doing in terms of work. The main job was farming and was farming the arable land, the farmable land. I talked about that in the Unit 8 document analysis video when I was going over the same text, that they would not only work their own land that was granted to them by their manorial lord, but they also worked the manorial lord's land for no benefit to themselves. So there's a lot of basic farm work, plowing, sowing the seeds, weeding to make sure that the crops didn't get destroyed by weeds, and then lots of harvesting in the harvest time. But in addition to all those things, Cecilia's mother baked bread and brewed ale in the farmyard. She milked cows and made cheese. She took advantage of outdoor light to mend old clothes and stitch new ones. 
She tended a beehive. She collected eggs from her roosting hens. She fattened her pigs. She cared for a few apple and pear trees. She cultivated a garden that yielded onions, turnips, peas, beans, leeks, garlic, cabbages, and herbs. So that's a lot of work to be doing. And it's not necessarily all getting done every single day, but a lot of these things were. A lot of these things working the, the, the main fields that produced wheat and corn and rye that was used to make breads was done pretty much every single day. And then when those things weren't being done, tending to all these other tasks, like all of kind of the gathering stages of gathering, you know, herbs and other types of small things from gardens, tending to various animals like pigs and sheep and goats and horses, if they had any. Many peasants didn't. Some maybe had a couple of animals. Other v villages would have lots of animals that needed tending by the various people living in them, by the peasants living in them. All of this is time-consuming work that is going to be done repeatedly day after day after day after day, meaning the lives of the peasants are consumed almost exclusively by working. From sunup to sundown, everything involves lots of manual labor, lots of manual work that's got to get done throughout the course of a day. Continuing on to look at those, that arable field and the arable fields around. The author of this text, Judith Bennett, gets into the idea that I mentioned in the Unit 9 presentation about the three-field system that develops in much of Europe, especially Northern Europe in the High Middle Ages, where one field is planted with Things like wheat or rye, another field is planted with t various types of beans, and then the third field is left fallow so the soil can recuperate, and then the fields are rotated, where the next planting season, the fallow field, now has beans and legumes planted in it, whereas the previous field that had the beans now has the wheat and the rye. That way you don't exhaust the soil quickly over the course of time. You can make it last for longer. Bennett talks about how much of the arable or farmable land was held in common by the people of the villages of Stanion and Brigstock. And they worked together as a team of hundreds of peasants to manage all of these farmable strips of land, and they broke them into strips. It's not like Cecilia Pennyfatter's family controlled like 10 acres all in one big square block that they used. The arable, farmable land was divided among a number of different peasants, and each got a long, thin strip of it. And they would distribute the family holdings across numerous larger fields. That way it minimized risk, because if one field of like 10 acres was having problems, well then your family could still rely on the strips that you were farming in a couple of other plots Outside, on the outskirts of the village. You weren't completely ruined by having one entire plot destroyed. So they divided them into, this arrangement is sometimes called strip farming because each field was divided into strips tended by different families. Scattering a family's lands held several advantages. It spread risk, as I just mentioned, for if crops in one field had a bad year, crops in another might do fine. It facilitated the sharing of plows and draft animals, for several households could pool their resources to plow a field containing their strips. And it encouraged parental generosity to children, for instead of a block of family land that had to be held together for a single heir, parents, might, parents held many strips that could, if they wished and their bailiff allowed, be more easily dispersed among children. So minimizing risk, helping with inheritance if you have multiple children, which in the beginning opening section of this text talked about a lot of times over a 20 year period a woman might have as many as eight or more pregnancies so you're going to have a lot of kids even if half of them die in childbirth or when they're young you're still going to end up having four or five if not more children <clears throat> and it fostered if not forced at times cooperation with your neighbors if there is a field of 10 acres and it's divided into all these strips like say 15 strips and each strip is held by a different family, then you've all got to work together to pool your labor, to pool your tools, to make sure that you can farm all of those strips appropriately. 
Bennett also mentions how the three-field system wasn't necessarily used everywhere in places like Mediterranean soils, where it was too hot and too dry for much of the year. Two-field division was fine, but in places like in northern France, northern Germany, and in England, the three-field system was what was needed in order for effective management of all of the territory. Land that wasn't used for farming was used for pastures or used for meadows, either as hay fields for, or for further grazing of animals. These lands were also held in common and used and managed among all the people. Elsewhere in England and Europe, some peasants supported themselves almost exclusively with animal husbandry, particularly if they lived in mountainous regions or areas with poor soils. So raising animals is something that some peasants, not specifically Cecilia's family, but some peasants did as a means of making a living. And it talked about how in this paragraph here that these were common lands, these pastures and meadows, so everyone had to agree how many animals each family was allowed to graze in the pastures and for how many days a week and for how long so that way one family didn't one family's animals didn't take up all of the resources and leave other families with nothing so there's a lot of cooperation going on among these peasant families all living close together in these as Bennett calls them nucleated villages I mean kind of isolated little communities with all their farmland and resources surrounding them Horses and oxen pulled wagons and carried burdens. Sheep produced wool that could be marketed to local merchants. Cows and goats gave milk that could be turned into cheese. People ra uh, rarely drank milk. Pigs were raised, especially for their meat. These animals supported peasant families directly with their wool, milk, and meat, and indirectly through their contributions to arable husbandry. Their waste fertilized the fields, and their pulling power enabled peasants to plow fields. So in addition to the human labor that was needed to manage all of the land for everyone's survival, animals and managing animals were also useful and needed for their ability to help the growing seasons, to help farm the land, and for the other resources they could provide, whether it's through products like milk being produced that can make cheese, or whether it's pigs that could be slaughtered that can be then used for food, or whatever the case is. The other thing I want to discuss from this particular document is Cecilia, uh, Cecilia Pennyfatter's world. I like the diagram that Bennett has included. Here's This is essentially the relationship between all these different little communities. There's Brickstock and there's Stanion where Cecilia Pennyfatter and her family lived. Then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight other communities that are all within 10 miles of where Brigstock is. And it talks about how Cecilia Pennyfatter's mom could get to the market in Corby. She could walk two miles, sell some eggs, sell some cheese, and then walk two miles back and be home within the course of a day. Her dad could walk to Gettington Market, and he could walk a couple of miles to Gettington, sell some products, get some other uh, different type of products, and then walk back and be home by supper time. So even though Many of these peasants aren't going to have horses that they're going to ride for riding purposes. They have horses mostly for pulling plows, not necessarily for riding like aristocrats and nobles would. They still have the ability to leave their own individual villages and hit to other villages where they can talk with people, as Bennett says. They can exchange products. They can buy products and trade and barter for products that they're not growing domestically in their village. But it's important to keep in mind, though, that this is one of the huge differences that we're going to see between medieval peasants and medieval aristocrats and between medieval people and people today, and that their world, the world of peasants in the medieval era was actually quite small and quite restricted. If anything, according to Bennett, was outside of like a 15-mile radius, you're not getting there. She calls a trip of 60 miles to get to the town of Lincoln, a pilgrimage. Normally you think of pilgrimages as these long journeys where you'd go to like Jerusalem, like thousands of miles away. Today it's relatively easy for us to travel 60 miles. 
I mean, you can hop in a car and in the space of like an hour, you can be 60 miles. In the Middle Ages, if you were a peasant, 60 miles is a massive trip that would take numerous days, if not a week for you to traverse, which meant overnight stops at other places or camping out under the stars in fields, which might not be the safest thing to do. So their world, their universe essentially, was actually quite small and consisted basically of these 8 to 10 small villages that existed within walking distance. And if you couldn't walk there and back in the space of a day, then it kind of doesn't exist to you. People knew of these other cities like London and other major cities. They knew Westminster. They knew of those places because that's where kings and queens and archbishops lived. But they rarely, if ever, went there. Their lives were very, very restricted compared to medieval aristocrats <clears throat> and nobles who, especially if you're a young man training to become a knight, you would go on a tournament run, meaning you would travel around France, northern and central France. You'd go into the German territories. You might travel to northern Italy and all around England and Scotland and Wales competing in tournaments. So you'd see lots of the wider world. If you go on a crusade, you if you're going by foot, you'll usually go through the southeast German territories, into Hungary, into the Balkan Peninsula, through Constantinople, and then into Syria, into Turkey, and then into Syria. Or maybe you'll go through France to go to ports and then cross the uh, Mediterranean Sea on ship, stopping at islands like Sicily, and then Cyprus, and then on to on to Palestine. You'll see wide and diverse areas of the world. If you're a peasant, that's not happening. Unless you also volunteer to grow, go on a crusade, which many of them did, but a lot of them didn't because they had to stay home so they could keep their economies running. So compared to aristocrats, peasants have a much, much restricted view of the world and much, much less information about the world and its people. However, the last thing I want to cover from this text is that Cecilia and her family were, as Bennett says, integrated into the wider world because of the various levels of bureaucracy of English government and church. So, for example, by the late 13th century, English kings offered justice to their subjects in a variety of forums, including hundred courts, county courts, courts in Westminster, and most importantly, courts convened by itinerant justices. Most of the crimes and quarrels of Brigstock were easily resolved in its three-weekly manorial court, but some crimes could only be adjudicated in royal courts. Any untimely death, for example, had to be investigated by the king's coroner, and any accused murderers could only be tried before the king's justices. So there was an opportunity to get connected into the wider system of royal governance through the court system that's developing and emerging by the time Cecilia Pennyfatter comes on the scene. The exchequer, the heart of the royal finances, also reached into the lives of Cecilia and other people in Brigstock. When the king's officers arrived to collect taxes, they expected cooperation from local deputies and prompt payment of local taxpayers. So the fact that they are raising either crops to use as payments or crops to sell in markets to raise money that they can give to local tax collectors also ties them in to larger and wider systems of governments and, uh, governance and administration. And finally, the military demands of England's kings also touched the lives of ordinary peasants expected to contribute men and supplies to the army. So, Young men might even be recruited or might even be hired by kings by this point to serve in armies, either for wars in France or wars as pilgrim and crusades to the Holy Land or to Spain or to fight against domestic nobles, other English nobles. So despite the fact that peasant worldviews are very, very restricted, they can and are plugged into larger systems in important ways. So basically what we're seeing then from this text talking about Cecilia Pennyfatter and her existence is the idea that peasant lives are filled with lots of work, whether doing the main tasks of farming the farmable land or kind of adjacent tasks like managing orchards, gardens, domesticated animals, those types of things. They do not live lavish lives. They live in small, dark, smoke-filled, 
houses that are weak structurally and can easily be broken through by robbers, and you would imagine then probably strong winds could create some damage to their homes as well. Their worldview is very restricted, and it doesn't really mention in this article any type of formal education other than uh, Cecilia's brother, who goes off to train to be a minister. It doesn't mention any other type of formal education for her parents or her or her sisters or anything else. It rarely, other than just mentioning children playing, doesn't talk about a lot of leisure activities that peasants were engaging in because their lives were mostly based around work. Because they are in a group of people that is expected, as we talked about from the other excerpt from Cecilia Pennefatter, they are the third estate, they are those who work. They're supposed to do all the manual labor to support the nobles and the church. So that gives you at least kind of a Cliff Notes version, a, a good window into what peasant life was like. Let's go to this article from the Ancient History Encyclopedia about what life was like for the aristocracy during the Middle Ages. And we'll see that it's quite a bit different than what Cecilia and her family are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. The aristocracy, connecting to that threefold division of society, they are those who fight. Meaning, they are the group of people who defend society and defend the people of a kingdom from internal enemies like robbers and thieves and brigands and external enemies. Other kingdoms, maybe uh, foreign opponents like the invasions of Muslims and Magyars and Vikings who want to attack people, that type of thing. So their main job, their main task is to constantly train for warfare if you're a man. If you're an aristocratic male noble, you're going to spend your time learning how to use various types of weapons, learning how to ride a horse, learning how to wield weapons while riding a horse, learning how to move in a suit of armor, learning hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques. That's what you're going to spend all of your day doing. But that doesn't take up like 8 or 10 or 12 hours in a day. So when they're not doing those things, what are they doing? Well, an author we've seen before... Mark Cartwright is going to tell to us about the leisure activities in an English medieval castle. So right off the bat, we're seeing a major difference here between aristocrats and the peasants we just talked about. Peasants don't have lots of leisure time. Yes, the calendar is broken up by Sundays, where you take a day off, and lots of religious holidays like Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, and lots of other kind of minor holidays that break up peasant lives throughout the year. I mean, all told, there's almost a hundred different religious holidays. So in a year, that's like a third of the year off. But the other two-thirds of the year, when you're not doing these days off, you're working from sun up to sundown, and you're working very hard, doing a lot of hard manual labor. For English nobility, though, and this would also be true for nobility across Europe, they've got lots of leisure time to engage in lots of different activities. They don't get up and then instantly start training for war and then they do that for 12 hours until the sun goes down and then they go to sleep. And also, since aristocratic ladies aren't normally wielding weapons and fighting in wars, what are they doing? Well, let's learn about what aristocrats in medieval England are doing. First of all, one of the main tasks, leisure activities that nobles enjoyed was hunting. And as Cartwright tells us, Hunting was the greatest example, as it not only was a leisure pursuit, but had the practical rewards of improving horsemanship and dexterity with weapons, as well as livening up the castle dinner menu, too. So hunting wasn't just a leisure activity. It was primarily a leisure activity, but it also helped you learn how to ride a horse through difficult terrain, how to ride a horse while hunting something, how to wield weapons like a lance or a bow and arrow while mounted. It had some practical value, and hunting is one of the primary leisure activities. If you read books about the Middle Ages or you look into primary documents about the Middle Ages, you will see references to hunting constantly. It's one of the major things they really liked to do, these noble warriors. They liked to go hunt game. Interestingly enough, it says here, forests were a hugely valuable resource in medieval times, and they had their own officers and inspectors to make sure they were not damaged by local farmers. 
infringements such as grazing livestock or felling timber on a castle's lands without permission led to prosecution in courts dedicated to forestry matters. Anyone who was caught poaching met with severe punishment such as fines, imprisonment, or even blinding. So these large woodlots are being hemmed off from the common folk. These are noble preserves only. Only aristocrats can go hunt there. Only aristocrats have the resources to buy a license from the, uh, from the noble who controls the land to go hunt in these woods. It was mentioned in the previous document that I gave you that sometimes peasants did creep in to, to noble woods and shoot some deer, shoot some rabbits to supplement diets, but they had to be extremely careful because there were, as Cartwright is telling us, severe punishments for violating the rules that, no, that normal, common, everyday peasants could not hunt or take things from the woodlots. They were the exclusive preserve of the nobles. That indicates a profound difference, again, between those that have and those that have not. Another uh, activity that both medieval men and women got into was falconry, hunting with birds and using falcons and falconry as a means of showing off your wealth and power because falconry was not a cheap thing to get involved in at the time. Without firearms, a falcon was the only way to catch birds which flew beyond the range of an archer, although for the medieval nobility. The whole sport had a mystique and mythology about it beyond the expedience of bagging a few fowl for the table. Indeed, women also practiced falconry, as can be seen on many seals depicting a noble woman and her favorite hawk. There were even, as it mentions, books about falconry written by people like the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, indicating how popular and how seriously they took this particular sport. I once had a student whose boyfriend was into falconry, and she asked if I wanted to, her boyfriend to come in and do like a demonstration in class. And I almost, almost agreed to this. But then I started picturing like this really horrible situation where a falcon goes friggin' insane. And students' eyes are getting clawed out. And there's this falcon flying all around the classroom. And then I get sued because I didn't get the college's permission to let this happen. And I thought, you know what? Let's not do that. But it would have been cool if the college would have let me had I asked them, which they weren't ever going to let that happen. That's let, let, Let's be perfectly honest about St. Clair County Community College. They are risk averse, and so they are not going to let something like that go down. But it would have been awesome to see it happen, though. Not like the gouging of the eyes, but like a, de a falconry demonstration. I don't want my students to get their eyes gouged out by falcons, okay? Let me make that clear right now. Another pastime, <clears throat> one that I talked about in the Unit 9 presentation, were the tournaments. What better way to practice the art of war and to get used to what it's like to be in the heat of a battle than doing mock battles in the form of tournaments? In fact, there was an entire tournament circuit that was created on continental Europe where European knights from the continent and from England, could fight in one tournament, then travel to another part of France and fight another tournament, then travel into the German territories and fight another tournament, and so on and so forth. Getting lots of real-world kind of battling experience without as much risk. I say as much because they're still risky affairs. The competitions took two formats, as I talked about in the presentation. Either a melee, which was a mock cavalry battle, not really, it's, it's, an, it's a battle between knights on foot, where knights had to capture each other for a ransom, or the joust, where a single rider armed with a lance charged at an opponent who was similarly armed. To minimize the risk of injury, weapons were adapted, such as the fitting of a three-pointed head to the lance in order to reduce the impact, and swords were blunted. Such weapons became known as arms of courtesy, or a plaisance. <coughs> So these were great ways for, no, for especially young and upcoming nobles to show their worth, show their fighting skills, test their manliness, and to make money. I mentioned a guy named William Marshall in the Unit 9 presentation and how he went on the tournament scene, defeated 200 knights, and when you defeat them in battle, you get to actually keep them until their families ransom them, pay the ransom to get them back. I mean, it seems like in all these tournaments, you think of like Renaissance festivals, which 
They're not Renaissance festivals. If I can be pedantic for a moment, they're not Renaissance festivals. They're medieval festivals is what they are. You think, oh, you know, they're like these honorable chivalric knights. No, if you like knock someone down in a melee and they yield to you, you pick them up, you put them in the corner and say, you're going to stay with me until your family pays me a boatload of money to get you back. I mean, these are like Christian knights doing this to other Christian knights. Part of the reason why the Catholic Church was not too keen on tournaments. But these things could also be quite dangerous. There is a French king who was participating in a tournament. And he and the opponent in the joust, their lances both shattered on each other's shields. And a splinter of wood, a big splinter of wood, flew through the eye slit in the king's visor. Hit him in the eye, went through his eye into his brain, and killed him. So these jousts are serious things. Despite the fact they're using blunted weapons, these guys are fully armored, charging at each other on, you know, horses that weigh hundreds of pounds. The knights themselves weigh 100 or 150, 200 pounds, and they're wearing like 80 pounds of armor, and they're charging at each other and hitting each other with long lances. I mean, there's no way that's going to be safe, even in the form of a tournament. It wasn't all just excitement with tournaments and falconry and hunting. Nobles were also usually more educated than peasants were, although not always, but many of them were at least taught how to be literate and numerate, and many of them would get involved in various forms of literature, like I mentioned in the Unit 9 presentation, like troubadour poetry, poems written uh, as love poems by knights, for some sort of noble lady who they're dedicating their their pilgrimage to, or they're dedicating their life to so they can live to be a better noble and all that stuff. <clears throat> but it wasn't just those types of books that nobles enjoyed. Books, really sheaves of illuminated manuscripts, were available on all manner of subjects besides poetry. There were handbooks for self-improvement, such as good etiquette at table and chivalry in general. None more famous than the 1265 Book of the Order of Chivalry. There were treatises on quintessential aristocratic pursuits, such as hunting and falconry, as mentioned above. Then there were the stories which had survived from antiquity, such as the Trojan War or Adventures of Alexander the Great, where characters and events were given a distinctly knightly, a distinctly knightly chivalric slant, appropriate to the medieval mind. Stories such as The Romance of Troy or The Tale of St. George's Tussle with a Dragon was popularized by the 1260 The Golden Legend by Jacobus de Varane. So lots of tales and lots of types of stories that were, that were kind of floating around as books became more commonly seen across Europe. Courtly romances, troubadour poetry, heroic epics. All these things are stories that literate knights and ladies could enjoy as part of their leisure activities. Lots of different types of games. They played dice, they played backgammon, they played chess. Both men and women did this. Interestingly, gambling does not seem to have suffered from any negative reputation, and even clergymen are recorded as indulging in it. Chess introduced to Europe from India via Arabia around 1000 CE was known as the Royal Game because of its huge popularity. So, Gambling doesn't seem to be something that the nobles thought was necessarily a bad thing, probably because they could just extract more resources and wealth from their overburdened peasantry if they lost some money. So they didn't really care all that much. Uh, th these two sections... <laughs> I laugh when I read these two sections describing these games. Parlor games included hot cockles where one person must kneel while blindfolded and guess the identity of the person striking them. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'm just trying to picture how you explain to someone this game. You're like, okay, okay, dude. This is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to play a game. This is awesome. You're going to put a blindfold on. Okay, okay. Says the other person. All right, I'm going to get blindfolded. Okay. Then you're, you're, you're going to get on your knees. Okay, okay. And then we're going to hit you, and you got to guess who's hitting you. And they're like, wait, what? So I just have to sit there and get beaten and guess who's attacking me? 
Yeah, yeah, that's the game. Cool, right? Another game was Hoodman Blind, where one person must catch another member of the group, but have his head covered by a hood. So you're literally running around, literally blindfolded, at some of these games. Seriously, who thought that this was fun? Who came up with this and said, you know what would be fun? If we put a hood on somebody so they can't see and said, now you, you run around chasing other people to see if you can grab them. Wait, I can't see them though. Yeah, I know, that's what makes it fun. Oh, okay. Not exactly how I would define fun. Okay, I gotta admit, this picture of a medieval jester really creeps the hell out of me, so passing on. And then lastly, music, dancing, and festivals. Um, they would oftentimes at feasts, either feast celebrating a birthday or a feast celebrating an aristocratic son being knighted or a marriage feast or a religious holiday feast. They'd have bands that were playing. It talks about some types of different instruments like an early form of an oboe, lutes, recorders, early violins, drums and bells playing. They'd have... Sometimes gestures like the uh, gestures like the creepy guy pictured here, who would tell stories accompanied to music, tales about knightly valor, tales about frightening forests, all types of different things that they would use as enjoyment. So basically, we see here that the lives of aristocrats are far, far easier than are the lives of medieval peasants. Medieval peasants are doing all of the real manual labor. Medieval aristocrats are not deigning, they're not condescending to get involved in manual work and manual labor. They're not going out and farming the fields. They're not tending to horses. They're not slaughtering pigs and making meat out of them. They're not getting milk from goats and then turning it into cheese. They're not collecting wild herbs or ha maintaining gardens to get grown herbs that's the peasant's job. The noble's job is to train for war. And he can justify hunting by saying, well, I'm learning how to ride a horse to train for war. He can go on a tournament that takes him to another country where he can be exposed to another language and meet interesting people and see a place other than one that's within a 10-mile radius of his castle. Which, by the way, he's living in a castle, not a 30 by 15 mud hut. And say, well, I'm training for war. And then he can train for a couple of hours a day and then spend the rest of his time doing falconry or playing chess or reading in a way that medieval peasants have no time and no leisure activity to do. The last thing I want to talk about is getting into now one of the major economic developments in the High Middle Ages, and that is the revival of trade, which then prompted the rebirth of cities and towns all across the European landscape. And one of the things that I mentioned was that oftentimes merchants and artisans, groups who would be the people living in the towns and working in the towns, you know, tanners and butchers and carpenters who are making things and then selling things on trade, developing trade networks, they could not be governed with the same types of rules that serfs on farms could be governed by. They needed their own separate set of laws and rules that guided their lives and regulated their lives. Oftentimes, they would gather enough wealth together that they would purchase from the noble who held the land on which the city existed for certain rights that would allow them to do what they did, that would allow them to sell goods, that would allow them to buy goods, that would allow them to make money that they could then use to fulfill the yearly payment to the noble to keep those rights or to make up for a giant lump sum payment that they had to make up front to get those rights. This is the Charter of Loris, a city in France that was granted by King Louis VII in 1155. And so I don't, want, I don't need to go through all these provisions, but there's a few of them that I want to go over that are especially important to understanding how the lives of medieval city dwellers were going to be different than the lives of medieval peasantry and people who were living out in the countryside in smaller villages, like the penny fatters that we just looked at a few moments ago. So number one says, Everyone who has a house in the parish of Loris shall pay as sends, a tax, six pence only for his house, and for each acre of land that he possesses, possesses in the parish. 
So the fact that it says six pence only indicates that other people not living in this city probably had to pay more money in taxes for their homes and for the land on which they lived. <clears throat> no inhabitant of the parish of Loris shall be required to pay a toll or any other tax on his provisions. And let him not be made to pay the measurage fee on the grain which he has raised by his own labor. So not only do the people living in the city not have to pay any tolls or any other tax on their property, but if they go to measure grain, so that way it can be baked into bread, they don't have to pay a fee for that. And you get the sense that if they don't have to in the city, those living outside of the city more than likely do have to pay a fee for measuring grain. Um... At whatever facility the manorial lord is set up to do that. No burger, that's just the name that is given to people living in towns and cities. They're urban dwellers. In Germany, they're called burgers. In England, they're called burgesses. And in France, they're called bourgeois, which is going to lend its name to bourgeoisie, which will come up. Not in 101, but if you take History 102, you'll learn all about the bourgeoisie. No burger shall pay a toll on the road to Etamp, to Orléans, to Milly, or to Melon. So when you're traveling from the city of Lourdes to these four towns, you don't have to pay tolls to use those roads. Toll roads were ways that local nobles used to make themselves a little bit of money. No one who has property in the parish of Lourdes shall forfeit it. For any offense whatsoever, unless the offense shall have been committed against us, meaning the king, or any of our hosts, I don't know exactly what that term is referring to. I'm guessing it's any of the high-ranking personnel who are working for or on behalf of the king. So if you commit a crime against directly against the king or one of his main guys, then yeah, you get your property confiscated. But other than that, that will not be a punishment for committing crimes. No one, neither we nor any other, shall extract from the burghers of Loris any tallage, a type of tax, tax, or subsidy. So now, not only can the king not charge them taxes in the city, but nobody else can. So if the king were to grant the land on which the city of Loris lied to another noble, that noble could not then tax the land because this charter of liberties has been given to the inhabitants of this city. No inhabitant of Loris is to render us, the king, the obligation of corvée, which is forced labor like one or two days a week, except twice a year, when our wine is to be carried to Orléans and not elsewhere. So the king cannot force the people of the city of Loris to say, leave the town to go help with the harvest in the countryside. He can't do that. They are free from forced labor other than helping the king take his wine to the city of Orléans. That's it. That's the only city that it can get taken to, and it can only be done twice a year. Any burgher who wishes to sell his property shall have the privilege of doing so. And, having received the price of the sale, he shall have the right to go from the town freely and without molestation, if he so desires, unless he has committed some offense in it. So, he's giving the people in the city the right to sell property and to leave the town whenever they need to in order to sell goods. Remember, serfs in, out in the countryside are tied to the land. They can't leave without permission. And most of the time, their local nobles won't give them that permission. Now the people of the town have the right to leave and come and go whenever they please. Remember, serfs and peasants, all their property was theoretically owned or by the local noble, was held by the noble, not them. And so if you wanted to sell or your property, sell some farm equipment, you had to get permission to do so. Now the people living in the city of Loris don't have to get that permission because it's being granted to them in this Charter of Liberties that they've been granted. And then the last one, we, meaning the king, they use the royal we where they refer to themselves in the third person. We ordain that every time there shall be a change of provosts in the town, meaning town leadership, the new provost shall take an oath faithfully to observe these regulations. 
And the same thing shall be done by new sergeants every time that they are installed. So when new officials from the king or new officials from the town are installed who manage affairs in this city, they will swear an oath to defend and protect and enforce all of these provisions and more. You can see it skips from 18 to 35, so there's more of them. This is just an excerpt. They will defend and respect these provisions and the protections that people are being granted in this city and town. And the people, as I mentioned in the Unit 9 presentation, they needed these types of protections. They needed these types of liberties so that way they could do their job. And nobles and kings were very apt to give them these privileges because they could make money off of them. Because towns and cities were becoming the hubs of economic activity. They were the real money makers. As it says in the introduction here, this was not written at the time. This is an introduction read by whoever it is that scanned and uploaded this document. To the growth of the medieval economy, to the point where towns, although containing a minority of the population, were at the forefront of economic activity, is among the most significant aspects of the 11th and 12th centuries. So even though towns and cities don't have a large chunk of the population total of an entire kingdom, when you look at how many people were in these kingdoms, a small percentage were actually living in towns and cities, they were the ones who were on the vanguard of all the economic development. They were the ones who were on the vanguard of all the trade. They were the ones who were on the vanguard of money coming back into the medieval economy when it had basically disappeared in, after the collapse of the Roman infrastructure in the Western world centuries earlier. And kings and nobles were very keen on understanding that and trying to take financial advantage of it, which prompted them to issue charters like this and give the people living in towns and cities the types of privileges that we've seen here. And that does it for this first video. The second video is then going to cover this film, Filthy Cities, Medieval London, and pick up on this talk about medieval cities. In this case, talk about the growth of such cities and many of the problems they experienced as they were developing and growing in physical size and especially growing in population size. It's also going to cover a, an article about the rise of medieval universities and what's going on at universities, and then look at an example of scholastic thinking, a primary document that is one of the major proofs of God's existence that was created during the High Middle Ages. So check out that video for me now, please.